Okay, against plagiarism, you'll notice, is everyone in Rockhampton happy with the lighting, please? Is that all right? Too bright? A little bit lower? You, I know. <laughs> well, this is... <laughs> I know. It's all right. Dave, Dave wants another... Co- okay, sorry, I'm just checking that people in Rockhampton are happy it's a bit bright in this room. I deliberately didn't put my, my school or department name because we're in such a state of flux I could have typed it on Friday and got it wrong by today. So, and one would hate to incur the wrath of the dean on this matter. You never know, she might tell me off in a meeting. So, okay, this talk, this seminar is against plagiarism and as Jenny said, I have to sing for my supper, it's true. If you get one of these teaching awards, then you have to say something the next year. Bear that in mind, Dale Trott, who's sitting in the back row. Okay, he already knows. Fine. What I want to talk about is how I found plagiarism occurring quite commonly in some of the assignments submitted in my courses and three strategies that I've tried for reducing it. And I will go to the PowerPoint, but I'll try and sort of pop myself up occasionally because there's nothing worse than sitting eating your lunch in the region and you can't even, no, they can't even see you. So, okay, computer sorted. Nice yellow background, nice black writing without serifs. <laughs> okay, against plagiarism. Well, let's do it. What on earth is plagiarism? Well, plagiarism is the theft and use of techniques, data, words or ideas without proper acknowledgement. We all know that. And clearly, I've got this quotation from somewhere, so I really should have given a reference. But um, the good thing is it actually came from something I wrote last year, so that's all right. That's me. So I've, you, know, you can't really plagiarise yourself. It's something I've used. And as I said, this seminar is about strategies for reducing the use of material without acknowledgement from the internet or elsewhere. So it's a very specific type of plagiarism I'm talking about, but one that is nevertheless very common. And in terms of the strategies that I've been trialling now over the last, I hate to say this, probably 10 years, and that's appalling since I came up here for three and I'm still here. I mean, that's awful. Um, There seem to be some positive learning outcomes as well. Now, first off, though, there are levels of plagiarism, and I want to call these Well, I want to describe these in three ways. The first one is slabbing. I call this slabbing. I didn't get this from the internet or anywhere else. I made it up. And that is the cutting and pasting of slabs, whole paragraphs and even whole sections. Um, For example, the introduction to a published scientific paper without change. And I guess if you're guilty of slabbing, you really should be on a slab because that's a pretty terrible crime. Wholesale slabbing. Just getting a whole damn great big slab. Skipping is something I didn't realise was occurring all that much until I met a really excellent one in a postgrad detailed programme research and study, which I'll talk about later. But I'm calling skipping, where you get hold of several published papers on your topic and you take every second or third sentence within several of these and you string them all together and they make, which on the surface of it appears to be a fairly coherent and quite erudite document as well. But if you read it more closely, you find that it doesn't really make a lot of sense because the person starts using things like parameters and variables almost interchangeably. And when you front them, they say, well, I don't understand what that means anyway, and things like that. So that is skipping. And the final one, which, well, almost the final one, is snacking. And snacking is these all sort of feeding ideas, I suppose, in a funny way, (laughs) the big S. Snacking is when you take a sentence or even just a phrase or two here or there. But those are the three levels. And clearly, I mean, slabbing appears to be the worst. Skipping is pretty devious, and it's rather hard to pick. But snacking, I think we all snack. We all snack when we just talk to somebody for a while. We start using their phraseology and their terms before you know it. And as one supervisor once said to me, my original ideas become someone else's in a matter of minutes in the course of a conversation. Now, you might say at this stage, hey, Steve, surely there's something you've forgotten here. And, of course, that is sharing. Sharing... (laughs) The S is pretty important. Sharing is when you get two or more students submitting the same material. And the funny thing is, I've rarely detected true sharing in my courses. And most assignments that I put aside because I think they show signs of sharing turn out to be independent cases of slabbing, skipping or snacking anyway. And that's pretty obvious when you have a look. But in, I can give you an example. I've had, recently I set an assignment where several students kept writing about the digestive tract. And this digestive track worried me a bit. The, oh, sorry, I'm right on the board. No, track. That's a horrible pen. It's amazing what you can get cheap down in Brisbane on the special, six or five dollars. But um, they're big ones, though. Okay. The oh hell, I'm sorry. Stop the camera. Let's go to the whiteboard. Yeah, that's good. Okay. 
he's agreeing. Okay, track. They kept talking about the digestive track. What the hell is this digestive track? And it turned up in about eight essays. Aha, if I have sharing. But it turned out that track was actually a typographical error in the textbook the students used by McCants and Huser. And <laughs> McCants and Huser should be talking about the digestive tract in this very thick and authoritative physiology book, but they'd got track by mistake. And naturally, I emailed McCants and Huser and I said, Oi, you know, you've got some mistakes in your book. And Kathy McCants and Sue Huser from the University of Utah, Kathy emailed me back and said, Dear Steve, you are a dear. Oh, there you go. I mean, the relationship hasn't continued since then, but, you know, we're at the preliminary stages with this email. So, okay, that was what I thought might have been sharing and turned out to be an independent case of snacking instead. So, just going back to that. Um, all right, I've talked about slabbing, skipping and snacking, and I've mentioned sharing briefly. And the interesting thing is that slabbing plagiarism in the biosciences at CQ is around... Second level undergraduate, 60% of a class on one campus. I found evidence of slabbing, wholesale slabbing. Wholesale slabs of American and English English mixed together. I mean, 60%, ladies and gentlemen, is absolutely appalling, but I guess you can do wonderful things with statistics anyway, and therefore I'd better go to the whiteboard. And 60%, yeah, well, um, uh, three out of the five. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, well, a small class on another campus. But nevertheless, that's not so good. And therefore, I was quite concerned about that. And the students failed the assignment and had to resubmit. And unfortunately, the students all, I think, were so horrified by me finding out that they failed the exam as well. That was a bad outcome. <laughs> it really was. I mean, that was horrible. But nevertheless, they had plagiarised enormous slabs. And it was so rampantly obvious you wouldn't believe it. Fine. A second, third level undergraduate, and this is second, third level, one major case per year in a class of 35 over the last couple of years, and major and quite disconcerting. And even a postgraduate detailed program of research and study, that famous DPROS, which all of us have to do, had been 80% slabbed. And I was the reader for this detailed program of research and study, and I started reading it, and I thought, this is pretty good stuff. Read well, right on the topic, and as I read through, I finally got to a little bit in the middle which said, and the like. And so I stuck a circle around that and wrote, this is rather vague. And then I kept reading and the same fantastic material kept rolling out and I got suspicious, so I simply slabbed the sentence into Google and bang, I got the introduction to a review paper written by a couple of people in New Zealand a few years ago. And the funny thing is, when I compared it, it was absolutely word for word, except for that little phrase, and the like, which I'd circled, which the person had put in. So, right, I win. And um, there you go, that's a worry. So, slabbing is around. And, of course, there is inevitably as much or more out there than we have detected. There's never less. What about skipping? Well, skipping and snacking... Um, Honours and postgrad case, one honours and postgrad case of skipping during the last two years, one honours essay, which didn't seem to make a lot of sense. I managed to find sentences from about five papers and a couple of fairly dodgy websites that had all been just melded together. And the same, again, in another honours detailed programme research and study. The person had skipped. They had put in things, and the other super... I was one of the student supervisors. The other supervisor said to me, well, I think it, I think it might have been... He talks like this. I think... It, I think it could be plagiarised. You're the plagiarism boy. You'd better find out about it. Well, why the hell don't you? Well, that's not my job. <laughs> what is your job, sweetheart? So, of course, I had a look. And no, it wasn't slabbed. It had been, it had been skipped. When I fronted the person, they folded and they said they were almost relieved I had found out because they claimed they didn't really understand the material. So skipping was a good strategy. Not good. 50% of second-level undergraduate essays show some skipping. Not a lot, but it's there. And about 84%, or sorry, 84% of second-level undergraduates show some snacking, and it's so common that you don't really worry much about snacking. It's almost, ine almost inevitable if you read things anyway. Their way of using words and their sentences tends to come out before you know it. All right. It's clearly rife. Why on earth is there so much plagiarism? Well, that, that's a fairly trite question, because I think we know the answer. The world has changed. 
Back in the dawn of time when I went to university, you went to the library and there were hardly any photocopies, and those that were there used to, for five cents, often deliver a burning sheet of paper late in the day. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, you read things in the library, you wrote notes on index cards, and there was no internet. And a mobile phone was something in a comic strip about the future. Oh, dear. Now, the time I left, those voluntary separations were looking good already. Everything's out there just waiting to be slabbed, skipped, or snacked. You don't even have to work it out yourself. You don't even have to write it out. You just scan it or even cut and paste. Easy, indeed. And that is unfortunate because the opportunity for plagiarism is so incredible. I mean, suddenly the doors are wide open. The stuff is there. It never used to be there. You could copy from a textbook, but you had access to so few textbooks so you could copy from papers. You, again, had access often to so few, and you had to copy this out. It wasn't going to work. But I felt that perhaps the type of continuous assessment we set, and especially the type of essays we often set in the biosciences, tend to encourage plagiarism. So because of that, maybe we should, instead of, be, instead of punishing plagiarism, we should be trying to modify the assessment in the first place to reduce it. Or as someone said to me, it's like crime. Rather than leaving the car unlocked, you leave it locked. So I feel that the sort of essays we often set, especially in first year, but quite often in second year as well, the explanation type essays may actually foster plagiarism. I'll give you an example. Explain the major mechanism by which blood pressure is controlled in human beings. I'm not trying to sound like a biologist. But, um, or compare and contrast type 1 and 2 di diabetes, include a discussion of the causes of each. Now, in both cases, the in intention of this essay is quite clear. It's there to get students to do some research, to improve their understanding of this topic, to get them some practice in how to write, but especially to give them the chance to explain something, to work up their own explanation in both cases. Now, these aren't just give me the facts. They are develop an explanation and show us that you understand it. But nevertheless, sitting out there on the internet, there is a whole slab of explanation already. There are essays almost like that to be purchased if you want it, but there's a stack of published material anyway which does just what we're asking our students to do. And you'd be absolutely pretty mad if you didn't at least read those sites and the temptation to do a bit of cutting and pasting, especially since the student essay Strategy seems to be often to get a whole pile of stuff on the internet, download it by cutting and pasting, and then go through it and rewrite it yourself. And one of my postgraduates started doing that, and they've been do they were doing that in the write-up of their thesis. And I finally fronted them and said, you cannot do this. Oh, but it's so much easier. I just take things out. I just rework a sentence too, but they don't rework it enough. So it's often skipped and frequently snagged. Maybe we need to reduce plagiarism. Detecting and punishing plagiarism takes time and effort, and anybody who's been on those academic board appeal committees for students who've been um, accused of plagiarism and then appeal, it's a most thankless task. It's depressing, and you get four or five senior academics sitting around in a room at an amazing cost per hour of their time, and there is one student disputing whether they really did copy something or not. I mean, that is a, an absurd waste of time, and it's not pleasant for anybody concerned. So really, perhaps, we need to reduce the opportunities for plagiarism in the first place. Fine. Hey, I'm going to finally get to what I'm talking about soon. <laughs> Three strategies for preventing or reducing plagiarism. And just to make sure that everyone in the regions knows I'm still here, I'm going to go back on camera. And as I said, sorry about the shine. It's not good at all. And I did do the makeup under the eyes before this talk, I'm serious, I look sort of young and dynamic, but it's, the head is clearly a problem, and that could be largely sunscreen. That's true. All right, back to the computer. Okay, three, I want to talk about three strategies, and I've, I'm talking about these in a bioscience context, but with a bit of imagination, all of them, I think, could be adapted to other areas anyway, so it's not exclusively biology. One. Oh, yay! <laughs> It comes on the screen, I speak, <laughs> the paper critique. I, I've been using this now for quite a while, and it's not my idea. It's that, um, I, a colleague of mine at the University of Adelaide, when I was teaching with them, started using it. I'm sure it's been used elsewhere. But what you do is you give students a copy of a very recently published, I said scientific paper, but it doesn't have to be, 
that has errors in the experimental design or interpretation of results. In the arts, this could be a paper which has errors in interpretation without any problem at all. Now, this is a paper that could be a couple of years old or even a year old, and what you do is you go to the library, and you, well, or you get on the screen now, which is good, because in the, in the past, even five years ago, you could go to the UQ library on the excuse you were doing paper critique stuff. You could also see the dentist get your hair cut and probably go off to the Nick Cave concert that night as well, which is good stuff. But uh, now you have to just sit at your desk and moodily tap away in your terminal <laughs> and find what we have online. So you find papers that have got things wrong with them, clear, obvious things wrong with them, and you hand these out to your students and you say, I want you to constructively critique the experimental design. This is a bit focused, this one, but you could adapt it out in a different area. And there is nothing out there for them to, to seize upon about that particular paper. It's fairly new. The only thing they could possibly do would be maybe find a referee's report from the journal, and those things are confidential and just not out there anyway. So they get it, they have to critique it, and they have to give suggestions for improvement. And the interesting thing is they come to me and say, how many references do you want? And I say, I don't want any, just the paper. And they say, but I've got to give some background on these snails or these mosquitoes or whatever. And I say, well, why? You're criticizing the experimental design and the interpretation. All you need to refer to is the paper itself. But surely we need to know more about the animals they're working on. Well, no, you don't, because you're talking about the design. But I need to reference something. No, you don't. All you have to do is focus on this paper. And what we're doing there is we're looking at, we're looking for logical thought, we're looking for originality, and we're looking for their ability to write. All those things we try and foster, I think, in our written type assessment, but there's no way with this that they can go off and plagiarise. And the nice thing is, well, it's good for some courses. I wouldn't like to set it in first year in a hurry because, of course, first year students haven't had the second, well, the first and second year experience. It's, it's good for second year and very good for third year and very good indeed for honours. And the nice thing is you don't have to worry about plagiarism. You cannot plagiarise when giving a logically argued opinion about someone else's design and we're making suggestions for improvement. I've had no detected cases of plagiarism of any sort over eight years of use at CQU and two at the University of Adelaide some time ago. That's who I was before I came here. But as I said, the use is limited mainly to level two and above, but we use it in our honours program in what used to be biological <laughs> and environmental sciences and maybe something like enabling futures next week. Who knows? So, okay, that was the first attempt. And the nice thing about the paper critique was when you marked it, you didn't have to look for plagiarism. It's just, you just could not do it, which is nice. Well, the trouble is that I teach a couple of courses <laughs> And the majority of my teaching is something called pathophysiology, which, as I tell my students, is how we, how we get sick and how we die. So it's pretty wild stuff. And as part of pathophysiology, I tend, you tend to set essays that show students' understanding of physiological concepts. And one of my colleagues, John Parmenter, also teaches physiology, but he teaches normal function and he sets an essay where you talk about normal function and maybe a bit of abnormal, like discuss the mechanism for controlling blood pressure and explain how it works. Well, and students then all dutifully write their essays on blood pressure and they get stuff from the internet we know and especially even the explanations. And I didn't like that. So therefore, I decided to try and do something <coughs> a bit different. The controversy essay 2002 to 2005, clearly 2006 and 2007 were different because they are not here. Gosh, I bet you're just sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for the third one. Okay, the lecturer, that's me, reads some very recently published scientific papers and they find a new scientific concept that's radical and controversial. There's no shortage of these boys out there in any field and I assume it applies in other fields as well. Definitely engineering, well, almost consider engineering and science to be the same thing there. But you could probably apply it to concepts in education and even concepts about how particular playwrights or authors you know the interpretation of that if you want it. Now, what you do, you say, describe the new concept, compare and contrast it with existing thought and argue, again, their own opinion on the veracity of this new concept. And again, part A of this assignment, there may be the opportunity for a bit of slabbing and skipping and snacking, but part B, where they have to argue themselves on something that is so fresh and new, there's not going to be much out there at all. 
Here's an example, and I apologise for the size of this slide, so I'll read it out. The popular and well-established view is that osteoporosis is caused by a combination of insufficient dietary calcium, insufficient weight-bearing exercise. Goodness me, I'm up to date. Oh dear, we have a biochemist in the back row who started paying attention. <laughs> um, reduced levels, low levels of vitamin D, reduced levels of estrogen in females and testosterone in males. Now, that may, that's more or less the existing paradigm. But I found a paper which proposed that depending upon what you eat, and even what you eat can be very, very high in calcium, this paper argued that certain foods which have a metabolic effect and that they tend to increase blood pH, sorry, decrease blood pH, make it more acidic, may be one of the major causes of osteoporosis. And this was based on epidemiological evidence where they looked at diet in different communities and cultures. And my biochemist friend is already looking very dubious about the whole thing. He doesn't like it. Um, so, fine. With that, there's very little out there to help the student in terms of their opinion. They have to rely on normal physiology and normal biochemistry rather than just reading about the new view. They're normally given one paper. What did I just do then? Oh, okay, the question. Please compare and contrast the two. Do you think the new view is plausible? Why not? And I even warn my students, there's not a great deal of hard copy on the new view, and I give them a starting reference, and I even warn them the internet's a bit dodgy, which it certainly is. Fine, what about the outcomes? Slabbing, skipping and snacking still evident in part A, the comparison, not much of it, but not in part B, the argument. And of course, the assessment was based upon what they gave mainly in part B. It was heavily biased towards that. So therefore, in that sense, the students were being again forced to develop their own arguments with, a minimal, with minimal supporting material. Students said to me after the essay, that was really interesting and challenging. And what, I, what often happened is I'd leave my lecture and I have fairly large classes in Rockhampton and fairly large ones <laughs> elsewhere. And I'd find groups of students standing around talking. And they'd be arguing the toss about <laughs> osteoporosis, which I found very, very pleasing. And occasionally someone would attach, Steve, what do you think about this? And of course, with Blackboard now, there is an opportunity for much wider discussion amongst our group of students. And I have found, and I'll talk about this shortly, that they're using Blackboard for the same sort of thing. Some of the students whom I met a couple of years later absolutely staggered when the idea turned up on the news or in New Scientist. And that is, Steve, you were right all along. You know, you knew about this stuff. You know, I just went and did some reading. Absolutely blown away. But it's in a magazine. Yes, that's right. It was on the news last... Yeah, yeah okay, just go away. <laughs> I've got, got more papers to read. Fine. Now, that's okay. But last year, sorry, two years ago, I set an essay about aspirin and the possible pluses and minuses of a regular dose of aspirin, salicylic acid. And every essay that I started reading started off, and this is almost 200 essays, started off by saying the name salicylic acid comes from the um, Latin name or the Greek name for the willow salix, um, of which the bark contain, you can prepare a crude extract of aspirin. First time, oh, that's interesting. Second essay, oh, that's good. Tenth essay, oh, bloody hell. A <laughs> hundredth essay, and I'm bashing my head on my bloody willows. And finally, <laughs> the, the very last essay, of course, had the willow reference. And then one of my postgraduate students, just to wind me up, sent me an email in 160 font, which said simply, willow, willow, willow. <laughs> and that's all you need. And there, there'd been a huge amount of slabbing and a fair bit of, a fair bit of skipping, and it was damn boring as well for me to read. And my feeling was, I could do better than that. I wanted to read something new, fresh, and original from every student that made it worthwhile. And I wanted them to have something new, fresh, and original so they didn't just have part A where they talked about existing stuff and part B where they pushed their own arguments. So in 2006 and 2007, I thought I'd give the hypothetical case essay a whirl. And that is where the lecturer invents an entirely plausible but fictitious disease or concept. I'm willing to bet you could even put together a, a slab of prose if you're in, say, a different faculty purporting to be from a particular author and see what the students thought. So entirely plausible fictitious disease. There is absolutely no background material available about this at all because you have made it up. I don't know what you're doing in the regions, ladies and I'm getting looks from rock hands like shit. <laughs> okay, the student is forced to research normal function and then use their knowledge to logically speculate on the effects of this condition on normal function. Aha. 
Well, this is a bold approach, but it's got to be damn good, says he. Now, this is, I'm going to read this. Um, this is the, the question they were given in the course profile, and I'm going to be wild and crazy and sit on the bench and read it so I can see the screen. I can see it here too, sorry. At the January 2007, now, unfortunately, the course profiles have to be in in December, so this was a problem. <laughs> the January 2007 World Conference on Emerging Infectious Diseases, Dr. Klaus Weilerbaum and Professor Werner Hortebort, their names, um, described a new viral disease transmitted amongst humans by mosquitoes. The disease reported in 35 people from three locations is has been provisionally called mosquito-borne venous nodulation, which has a wonderful acronym, MBVN. Infection occurs after being bitten by a mosquito that's carrying the virus. And once you've been bitten by a mosquito, the virus is injected into the person's bloodstream. This is quite a common thing that happens with many diseases. So we have, I'm drawing on the board, but I'll put this up shortly. Mosquito injects, we all know this, how malaria gets around. That is a mosquito. Oh, hang on, Bob Newby's here, six legs. Okay, here we go. Proboscis and injects the virus into the bloodstream and the viruses reproduce in human cells, so therefore the virus invades the cells of the endothelium of the, va of the veins and simply takes over the DNA in those cells, reproduces, those cells burst and release more virus particles. But the net result of all of this is that growing out of the walls of the veins, you get these peculiar little bundles of dysplastic cells, that's cells that have undergone deranged cell division, and these, and I'm drawing them only on one side, sorry, I will put this up shortly, Delma, etc. I promise. I'm just being a little indulgent while you read the question. And what you end up with are these weird cauliflower growths inside your veins. And there's a picture on the whiteboard, which is so horrible, I'm almost ashamed to put this up. Hey, there it is. Mosquito on the left, this is a wing. Oh no, it's its body, sorry, Bob. Uh, only wings. Okay, wing, here we go. There's one, there's one over there too. Okay, head, proboscis. And after having picked up this virus, you instead of your veins being nice and clean and smooth, they've got these sort of weird cauliflower structures poking in instead. And Professor um, Werner Hortebort said, looking like it has many heads of cauliflower growing out from the endothelium and protruding into the veins. The growths remain in place and don't detach. Fine and I need to go move along. I might finally find the computer on this thing. Question is, from your knowledge of normal and abnormal physiology, which is just what my students are doing, please describe the likely consequences of being infected with mosquito-borne venous nodulation. Start by speculating what general effect these attached nodular masses will have on the normal function of veins. Speculate the likely effects of the condition on the function of the heart, lungs, and liver. And finally, please give your reasons so agreeing or disagreeing with the statement by Valabarm, being gross in a vein is not likely to affect the person's health. If they happened in an artery, it will be life-threatening. Now, that is a pretty solid question. There's a bit of background, and then the students have to talk about the general effects that these weird structures in the veins will have. They're going to have lots of effects. They're going to increase the likelihood of blood clotting in people's veins, so there's a possibility of deep vein thrombosis. They're going to slow flow. They're going to obstruct drainage of heart muscles, heaps of things. And a real sort of smorgasbord for the students to choose from. And finally, there's even a statement at the end um, saying, well, they have to really think about what veins and arteries are doing. So not only am I giving the students the opportunity to do a lot of research, but they have to really work out how the circulatory system functions. And this is one of the major areas where our students seem to be deficient despite what they've been told. Now, okay, some cautions. If you make something up, for goodness sake, make sure its name or its acronym isn't on the internet because a few years ago I put in an, a fictitious name that turned out to be an aerospace engineer in the US and they got 68 emails from my nursing class and finally sent me an email saying, what the hell are you doing to me? You know, there's some sort of terrible persecution because they just happen to be working on something where the acronym fits. If you made up, make up researches, make sure nothing else turns up on Google. So I started off with some names where I got Google hits and I just mutated those names letter by letter until I had no Google hit at all. And therefore I ended up with Hortebort, which is, it's a name, and Klaus Weilerbaum. Well, you know, you can see how these might have been quite good German names. And they worked in South America. Well, you would, because of course there's no broadband there or anything. 
So there's no chance they could ever have, it, have their own web page. Well, okay, you've got to be careful. Some very sort of, well, interesting outcomes start. I got a telephone call about three weeks into, before term started, even from Jill Muller in the library, and she said, what the hell are you doing, Steve? Snigger, snigger. She said, I've had a visit from a student, and the student has told me bitterly, this is the first time in my two years at university I've needed to speak to a librarian. <laughs> Whoa, good one. And Jill talked to her about her search strategy and the search strategy, strategy the student was using, which it seems is very common, is they just slab the entire essay question, the whole thing, straight from the course profile into Google and see what falls out. Not just a line, they don't snack or, you know, they just do the whole full kitty. And one of them even slaved my name and came up with my stats book. <laughs> nice one. And they puzzled, they worked through this one quite seriously. And there's no example in there including mosquito borne venous nodulation. So that, was, that intrigued me even to start with. I then, this is even before term started because as you know our students get onto things pretty fast. A student called me up and said, you've got the names of the researchers wrong. And I said, no, I haven't. No, you spelt them wrong because I put them into Google and Google had an off day. <laughs> and, and, okay, fine. Another student queried the qu wording of the question. Being gross in a vein, they're not likely to be life-threatening, they said. And they said, you have got that wrong. You mean benign, as in they're not malignant. And I said, no, it's being. I said, don't you realise that English is Werner Hortebort's second language? And the student said, that's so cool, you know those guys. <laughs> well, yes, I do. I mean, we're intimate companions. <laughs> They're beating inside the skull, trying to get out. And, but the interesting thing was, and this is even before term started, and I even, before I even got to speak to my students face to face, because, of course, we video streamed the stuff, so they had the chance of seeing the shine on the head and everything else there was intense blackboard discussion. And the students soon, soon worked out what I was up to, but the tone of the blackboard discussion is quite interesting. Well, I think so anyway. <laughs> oh, hey, the tone of the blackboard discussion changed. First off, we had astonished and slightly angry disbelief. And that's, they, were, they were cross. There's nothing on Google. I mean, hell, you know, the world as we know it has changed. And they, they, seriously, I'm getting emails. There is nothing on Google. They say, yes, yes. And then I got very characteristic, and this, this in a way is how I think we are often fostering assignment writing. They said, I want more information on the disease. How can I write this essay if I have no information on the disease? And I said, but I have provided you with all the information on the disease that is available. Why do you need more? But I want to know more. And then some of them started saying, I need to find out about mosquitoes. No, it's entirely irrelevant to the topic. You don't need mosquitoes, you need the paragraph in the essay question. This stage, as we're into the first week of term, several strong personalities, and I haven't yet done the stats, but I think they're the ones who did best in the essay, and that would be a nice thing to look at, blackboard use and blackboard discussion contributions and how well the students do in the class compared to those who don't, and I don't know how many people have done that. Some strong personalities read the question and the learning outcomes in the course profile, aha, and they began to dominate the Blackboard discussion. And that very quickly, especially helped on with some really super-duper avuncular hints by me in the first week of term on video streaming, that they realised the purpose of the question to get them to logically argue the consequences of these nodules in the veins. They'd worked out the purpose of the assignment. And the funny thing was, this led, again on Blackboard, and the nice thing about Blackboard is you have the data, because it's all sitting there, there was intense and remarkably detailed technical discussion about possible consequences and it got to say to I was having difficulty following it myself. I'll just quickly run through that. First person, they went to the World Health Organization. They looked up the website and two of my students emailed the World Health Organization about this disease and got the really super big piss off. Like, you wouldn't <laughs> believe it. You know, do not waste our time. Um, okay, I've looked on the site and I can't find anything. Do you think this is unscary? Well, I think that means unnecessary and I've put sick but maybe they meant unscary, but um, it's a good way of writing that word. I caught your first lecture, like some disease, and I think I heard you comment it wouldn't be easy to find information. Was I hearing things? <laughs> I've searched Blackwell Synergy and not come up trumps. Oh, excellent. I'm not surprised. I was considering putting up my own Wikipedia entry for mosquito-borne <laughs> venous nodulation, but that would have been ragingly mischievous, so I didn't. 
any assistance with direction would be appreciated. Good. Okay, fine. Then we got a few smart ones from considering the course profile was released in January before the conference occurred. <laughs> and from hints I've given, I have the impression there isn't a disease. If it's totally hypothetical, then the, name, the conference doctrine professor, whatever his name is, <laughs> seems to be irrelevant to the learning outcome. Ah, a very perceptive person. The aim appears to be to apply your knowledge and say what it could potentially do. We're encouraging good writing, we're encouraging logical thought, we're encouraging originality. Wow. Another person, I'm assuming he wants us to focus on the effects, um, then argued about the statement by the Vilebaum dude. They just didn't like that name. And the person commented on back, well, please correct me if I'm getting all this wrong. Well, fine. I was happy to say, yes, you're on the right track. And then they started getting technical and started demonstrating a great deal of effort and commitment to this assignment, which I found very pleasing. You could go on and on about this. Um, there was discussion of cardiac output. There was discussion of venous return. There was discussion of preload, afterload, oxygenation, things that they needed to know and often don't really come to grips with in lectures because they find it quite complicated. And this is the sort of thing I started getting, including the absolute sort of total killer email to me. Would this condition have the same effect as endothelium, blebbing and tylosis and be affected by virtue of the triad? Now, the safe answer seems to be yes. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> And the one that surfaced in my mind when I read the shit, I don't know. <laughs> and I, was, I, I had to really go look in the textbook. And unfortunately, Kathy McCants and Sue Hooser were not all that flat with their index. And, but I found it. And yeah, they were right. <laughs> it's true. So, and I was in that level of discussion is, I find, unusual amongst members of the class and very pleasing. Now, student comments on the assignment sheet. Well, this, uh, this is the yellow DTLS. You know, a cover sheet, they, they can write a comment on there if you want, like. And this one, this essay was a brilliantly composed test of student understanding the systemic implications of disease. Since then, they've sent me an email saying, I want to do a PhD with you, but I've said no. <laughs> I mean, this is disgraceful slime moulding. But it really, but, well, you know, I don't mind. Keep it coming. Um, and the other one, this has really helped me understand and appreciate how the circulatory system functions, written about 20 times. And I, that was with great sincerity, I feel. Well, I'd like to. Now, let's get serious. Some important outcomes. There were no detected cases of slabbing, skipping or snacking in the bulk of the essay at all. Very, very slight snacking in passing references to normal function. But there was hardly anything in the essay about that anyway. They just got the material and had to speculate. And the interesting thing is, and the essay marking criteria pushed these attributes there is evidence of logical and original thought. There is evidence of explanations in the student's own words, especially some very, very nice use of analogy, which you can use often in these physiological essays to great effect. And there was even some humour, which when you have marked 206 essays on this topic, the humour is quite nice to find occasionally as you're working through. All right. Now... This sort of essay I've been setting for two years now. I, now, this is hopelessly confounded in time and in terms of student groups and everything else, but the interesting thing is the mean mark, and I, I mark all the essays in my courses every year, and I marked in 2006 and 7, 2002, 3 and 5, but in 2004 I spent the most unhappy year as Associate Dean Research and then Head of School, and therefore I did not teach that course. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. And I have three ground down teeth covered in gold crowns now as a good indication of what happened. It's real Pirates of the Caribbean stuff in the back of that now. Okay, the mean mark. Look at what the marks did. I mean, maybe I just felt warm and happy about all this. Oh, it's Hey, now that's... I need the... I need to do something really... Right. Okay. Year along the bottom, essay percentage mark on the y-axis, and these two groups. Oh, God, too many coffees this morning. <laughs> these are the means, and these are the 95% confidence intervals for the means. So we're 95% sure, for example, that mean is in that range. Only 5% of likely values are outside. One-way analysis of variance on these data showed the data for 2006 and 7. this group was significantly different to this group, and there's no discernible trend. Oh dear, old's the shaking here. 
there's no discernible change in those three either. But of course, as I said, these data are confounded in time. Furthermore, having set that particular essay question, I might have been better disposed anyway. And, but at the same time, I have a very prescriptive marking sheet where if they show certain attributes, there's a tick in the box, and there are lots of boxes, and therefore you can extract out from those 100%. And of course, an easy way to check this would be to have copies of those essays and perhaps get someone else to mark them using the same sheet, which will be handy. But nevertheless, their percentage mark in the essay has improved. Doesn't mean, well, if it went down, I'd be worried. And what it really worried me was, I, I thought there was going to be a difference in the variance, which no one ever talks about. I thought that, in, generally, when the essays came in, I had some students who did outstandingly well, but I had the impression I had more down in the lower percentages, and therefore I was interested not only in the means, but the variance as well. But there is no, I applied a Levine's test, there is no significant difference in the variance of these five groups. If you might say, hey, what about your sample sizes? My sample sizes are ranging from about 120 to 206. So they're pretty robust in terms of these values. OK. It's almost time to finish, and it's quarter two, and I've gone on too long. The hypothetical case seems to virtually eliminate plagiarism. It also seems to foster original logical thought. It retains the benefits of getting students to write and to string words together on paper, which we seem to think are important, and I think are, but it has to be very plausible. If you offer a, a crummy example, they'll be on to you in seconds, and they won't be interested, I don't think our students be interested in doing something which is clearly a bit poor quality or shabby in terms of what they've been offered. This was, they soon realised it was hypothetical. I deliberately didn't tell them because I didn't want them to treat it lightly, so they got very excited about this, but by then the momentum had gathered in the class and the interest and as I said passionately to them in lectures, think of all the new diseases that are turning up. You need to be aware of these in a hospital situation. And, oh, yes, they said. And my final slide. Really, I guess, to summarise, the challenge of trying to prevent plagiarism made me think critically about what I was trying to do. But I think we need to think more carefully about what we set as assessment items in the changing world where it's so easy to plagiarise. The world really has changed in the last couple of decades. What really do we achieve by setting an assignment that encourages regurgitation of facts or explanations which may foster plagiarism? We need assignment topics and continuous assessment topics that really do something for the students, not simply, oh, well, we better set them an essay because we've got to give them a mark at the end. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, that's the baby, and I'll go on to the lecture camera and say we do have time before that smooth-voiced person comes on and says, Please note, your conference will end in five minutes. We'll speak. Thank you very much. And I can see one other campus room and the chair is empty. And <laughs> I'm <laughs> later in the aisles, but I'm willing to bet Delma is still there. And Kerry has his hand up. detecting it because you're getting stuff hard copy are you, are you typing stuff in again to uh, Kerry, that's very, Kerry's question sorry I'll re repeat that back in case that didn't come through Kerry's comment was hey you say it's more rife how are you detecting it are you getting hard stuff are you typing it in what sort of are you using a program there are programs for electronic assignments you can detect very easily sharing with these programs but they don't necessarily go and find you the stuff on the internet some do but I think the program CQ has can pick up sharing and that's all. That is parallel material in several essays in that digital drop box. It will go through and do it. I find what I, what I did, and when you mark all the essays yourself, well, you develop very rapidly, I'm sure you know, an eye for something being wrong. And that is, it's just too good or too smoothly written. Please note, too, your conference will end in five minutes. Or too inconsistent. <laughs> And it's that inconsistency. It's, it's, it's either something amazing like American and English grammar or spelling, or it is simply the turn of phrase you would not expect from anybody except a real professional in the field. And many years ago now, I read an honours essay where the student wrote that this concept piqued my interest, P-I-Q-U-E-D, and holy moly, you know, this, is, this is hot stuff, piqued. And, so, and I, I showed it to a colleague, and I said, I can't believe this. And they said, oh, that sounds like Rickliffe. And so I went to the textbook. Yeah, it was Rickliffe, slabbed straight out of Rickliffe. I mean, that's what I normally find. And once 
you find an essay you have questions about in your mind, all you do is you get a couple of succinct, salient sentences and type them in, and you can often find it first off. I've had no trouble whatsoever. But as I said, I'm probably under-detecting, but I think I'm doing pretty well. Hi, Steve. We Hang on. Oh, Delma. Yeah, yes. hi. Yeah. Um, Del I, th I think it's great you? that... I think it's great. It was a fantastic um, essay topic. and I did have a colleague here that was listening to it from the Communications Learning Centre and she thought it was amazing. Uh, it's only really suitable, though, again, for the... I can't see that. For the advanced... Um, I wrote the word but with dots. I knew there was going to be, hey, good stuff, big boy, but... Go on. Ha, 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 I'm used to this. <laughs> I wouldn't get away with plagiarism, would I? You recognise my style too well. <clears throat> Come on. It's only suitable in, for... My experience in first year, though, has been that if you give them a difficult topic that they are not able to grasp, and we are talking very early in their academic career, they are more likely to plagiarise. If you give them a topic they can handle and you heavily emphasise you are not smart enough yet to plagiarise, we will catch you, then we've had years where I haven't detected a single plagiarism case, and I do detect quite a few every year. Mm. That, that's a good comment, because what I'm talking about really, I feel, can probably be most successfully applied to second and third year. As I said, when the students have that, I hate to say skill base, I almost said toolbox, but I, you know, that's, that's horrible talk, um, to manage to cope with those ideas. But again, the odd thing was, I, te Delma, I tend to agree with you because the funny thing is, amongst my nursing classes, I don't get major plagiarism, but then I read them, as you would, sort of semi-right act, saying, don't even try it, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm so damn good at finding that out. Um, but you have to make sure that they believe this because there are a lot of cases of plagiarism still occurring in first year. And I think even in classes where people do do that, but... Yeah, give them a topic they're comfortable with and they won't plagiarise. Give them a hard one and they will. Well, these are very hard topics, but they simply have been forced out of plagiarism. I guess what I'm talking about is removing any opportunity rather than changing their behaviour in the climate where the material is available. And those are subtly, well, not even subtly, those are very different things. So that's a slightly different strategy. But yeah, I agree with you. Tell them, if you warn them, it tends to reduce it. But I'd also pass on a comment from my colleague, as I said, she had to leave, but she said that essay topic was really well written because it, it was addressing so many levels. The students could just do this, but then they could do on, go on and do the extra bits that you suggest towards the end of the question. Uh, yeah, deliberately open-ended to extend the good ones out, and I think that's so important that quite often we set assignments that, and that's why I was interested in the variance of those results. We set something that gives the class a general result overall, which doesn't really distinguish the good and the, the really competent and the less competent, whereas um, I was able to... Well, I gave some essay percentages of about 95% because they were so good and showed clear originality and sheer, um, the, well, competent development of thought. I th that's surely what a university is about, not just regurgitation of facts and concepts. No, I agree with you in first year. Maybe, though, we should try and look at the sort of assignment you could set in first year, going back to Delma's first question, where the students cannot plagiarise, but it's not too difficult. That, that would be a great challenge. <laughs>